Hello, I'm Valerie Biden-Owens, Chair of the Biden Institute at the University of Delaware. Today, I have the privilege of introducing Representative Nathan Carlo. Representative Carlo has represented Maine House District 137 since 2020. At age 24, he was the youngest legislator when he was first elected, and he is the youngest elected in over 100 years. He is a card-carrying member of Gen Z, which, to remind everybody, is the generation of people born in the late 90s and early 2000s. So thank you, Representative Carlos, for joining us on All Politics is Personal, a program where we introduce the public to the person behind the politician. Anyone can research your policies and accomplishments, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. We're here to talk about you. So let's start with childhood and growing up, Carlo. So I think my upbringing can be best described uh, as a trinity between faith, family, and really, really good food. What kind? Any All kinds. American, uh, particularly Maine, seafood, uh, fresh yeah. lobster, scallops, clams. Uh, and if, you're fry, if, you, if you fry them, that's really good, too. Well, you are Maine to your toes, aren't you? <laughs> I am. Okay. Uh, what about, do you have siblings? I do. I have three sisters, uh, and I'm the oldest of the youngest. I read that in your young life, when you were an infant, that there was some tragedy in your family. When I was uh, 11 months old, my biological father died by suicide. Um, I left a, a void in my life, and, you know, every Sunday after church and at every holidays, we would always gather as a family, aunts, uncles, cousins, siblings, grandparents, and we would bond as a family. Uh, and having grown up without uh, a father in my life for 10 years, um, I grew to appreciate the bond that my, my family meant to me. Uh, and, you know, when I was in elementary school, I never really noticed much of a difference between my situation and the situation of my friends and peers. And I think that's a credit to how hard my mom worked as a single mother uh, in raising me while working a full-time job and while going to school. Your mom was a nurse? She is. She is still a nurse. What's the age difference with you have the, your sisters? What's the space and time? Did, did your mom... Well, you said you have a stepfather, so your mom yeah. eventually remarried. She did, uh, when I was 10 years old. Um, and it's about, uh, I am about five years older than my younger sister, uh, and five years younger than my uh, older sister. All right. Now, um, did you have grandparents around? I did, having had two fathers, <laughs> essentially. I had a lot of grandparents. Um, and uh, one lives in Holton, Maine, uh, which is seven miles away from the Canadian border. Uh, and one lives closer to home in, in Westbrook, Maine. Uh, and the other lives in Old Orchard Beach. Well, uh, what I have found in life, uh, my profound words of wisdom, is that adversity uh, builds character much more than the spoils of victory. And that's what you just evidenced. The adversity that you had as a child led to the bonding and and your faith and family. So that's that's something to applaud and be Thank grateful you. for. Um, school, what were you like in school? Well, I think that there are two different stories that you can get from this question. The story that I'm willing to tell you and the story that you might get if you interview one of my teachers. Uh, but suffice it to say, I was thoroughly energetic, uh, but also I cared a lot about my education. Um, I certainly would describe myself as a student leader. I was involved in student council. I was in key club. I was class president of my class for two years. And I was the student representative on our school board uh, for three of those years. So you, uh, this is in your DNA, civic responsibility and uh, government? I would say so, though it's ironic because my parents are perhaps some of the least political people in the entire country. So I don't know where the gene comes from, but I'm glad that I have it. Was your school called uh, Bonnie Eagle High School? Bonnie Eagle High School. And you still are involved with it, right? I am. I'm serving my third term on the school board, uh, and then my second term as chairman. 
I've been on the board for seven years. I have heard my brother and many people say the hardest position to elect a uh, whole political office is to be on a school board or to be a mayor as opposed to a legislator because people know exactly where you live and, and can get to you with every problem. Uh, how's school board been? Well, I would agree with that. It's certainly been challenging. Um, but when you're dealing with people's children's education, nothing gets more personal than that. So as a school board member, you want to make sure that you're making good decisions, following thorough processes, uh, so that your students can have the same quality as education that I did when I attended uh, the institution and, and I graduated in 2018. Have you found that the, um, the intensity of uh, being on the school board and the parents' involvement has, is less or more than it was before? When I first started, uh, you could barely get any person to come to a school board meeting and speak at public comment. As, the, as, COVID, has, as COVID has sort of um, reminded people that our school boards are making important decisions for their children, uh, we've seen a lot more people coming to the school board uh, in a respectful way and, and telling us how they feel about important issues. Um, but certainly we've had school board meetings that last four or five hours. Uh, and half of that is dedicated to listening to the people who have come to speak with us. Uh, when you left high school, uh, where did you continue your education? I continued my education at the University of Southern Maine. I majored in political science, uh, and I'm still pursuing that degree uh, while serving in the legislature. So I've put uh, my education on hold so that I can serve my community. That's uh, that's a tough job, but as yeah. you said, your mother did that. She had her job and, and she was at, uh, gaining her education at the same time. She did. So you have a, a, yeah. a good example. Yeah. Uh, when we, and in our house, we're, there were always sayings, re, refrains that mom and dad would, we have, I have three brothers. So whatever something would come up, you could hear, uh, you know, I don't care what all the other kids are doing, you're not going, or your word is your bond. Did you have any uh, refrains that were, that were basically principles that, that have stuck with you that you heard all the time? Well, we heard those when I was a kid too, but one that my grandmother told me that has always stood out to me in my various elected positions was, God gave you two ears and one mouth, so that you'd listen twice as often as you spoke. Well, that's a good one too. It is. What we when you said that you you put your education on hold to govern, to go into uh, uh, civil society, civic duties, what what drove you to that? And what is the compelling reason that you are a public servant? Well, it's a funny story. Uh, it was never my idea to run for office, at least not when I chose to do it. Um, I got lunch with a friend of mine at his office uh, in Biddeford, uh, and he mentioned that my state legislator was going to be terming out of office. And he said, offhand to me, he said, perhaps you want to consider running. You've served on the board for six years. You're well qualified. You'd be the youngest elected in a long time. And I sort of dismissed it at first. And I thought, well, I have my degree to finish. I don't have any kids. I'm not married. How am I qualified to, to run and serve in the legislature? And I thought about it, and I texted him a week later, and I said, I'm going to run. Uh, and I feel that I've accomplished a lot during my three years so far in the legislature, um, getting important bills passed into law for my community to benefit uh, rebuilding and renovating our town office. Uh, which has been falling apart. It was built in 1972. We have a whole fund that could be used to fund the renovation project, um, but state law said we couldn't use that particular fund to build or renovate town halls. And so I got the law changed so that uh, the town hall is could offset the cost of constructing that facility wow. without raising taxes. When you first ran, did you run against an incumbent? I didn't. The incumbent had termed out of office. He had just concluded his fourth term of service in the House, and so it was an open seat. In your House, uh, can is it a nonpartisan election, or do you vote Democrat, Republican, straight ticket? Uh, no, they're not nonpartisan elections in Maine. 
Um, you have to be a member of a political party to seek the nomination for that party in Maine. Um, and that's how I was elected. Well, how, what, how'd you get the money or the campaign organization? You're a young, you're a Gen Zer, what I said, and you've not had experience. And this man, your friend at lunch says, you should run. How, how'd you pull it all together? Well, I ran a very nimble campaign. I can tell you that. Uh, we raised about 3000 for my first campaign, um, which we used to buy signs. Uh, and a few mailers. Uh, there are only 8,000 registered voters in House districts in Maine, so I felt that $3,000 was enough to get my name out there um, and tell the voters who I am and what I stand for and what I hope to accomplish on their behalf. Well, uh, did you have a tight race? Uh, it was pretty close. I won only by a few hundred votes. Well, I know that feeling, so that <laughs> congratulations. So to all those who say that their vote doesn't count, they should remember that elections can be pretty close. It sure does. When you were a kid, you said you you didn't think about or this you didn't think about running for the house. But when you were a kid growing up, you, you were in student government, and then you're on school board. What did you want to be? Well, I wanted to be a teacher. Uh, and I still want to be a teacher, and I think I have enough time to pursue that later on. Um, <clears throat> I knew when I ran for student council and when I joined the school board as a student member that I had some important contributions that I could speak as a student uh, and enlighten the decision makers uh, in the school to to improve things, to make things better for students. Um, I remember in particular... Uh, the year that I was first appointed to the school board as a student uh, was a very challenging time for our district. Uh, superintendent had uh, left. Um, he had resigned uh, amid some controversy. Um, and despite the accomplishments that he uh, was able to achieve during his tenure in office, it had really destabilized the community. And so I saw it as my role as a student member to unite the student body uh, to have some pride in our school community uh, and to not let us be defined by the reporting that was being covered on in the press. So what was your what was your slogan, your theme, your drive? I mean, slogans and themes are not are, are not the positions. But what, I mean, what how did you articulate that you that you're, you're a kid self-described? I, I, I bribed them with M&Ms okay. and York peppermint patties. And I wrote a message on each one of them and I signed my name. Uh, that I was running for, for, for class president and for uh, school board, um, and that was enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a that's a help that's a helpful hint. Uh, I think we're gonna get a whole lot more than peppermint patties right now. But uh, yeah. God bless you that you jumped in. Uh, your first job? I was a bagger at my local supermarket, Hannaford. Yeah. On the school board and both. Uh, when I was uh, serving on the school board, when I was a student in high school and attending college. And uh, the people of Buxton were fantastic. And I remember when I was out campaigning and knocking on doors, at least 50 people said, are you the Nathan from Hannaford? Oh, yeah. <laughs> they knew you, huh? What was um, your first uh, big experience, uh, major experience in politics. I mean, how did you, from not, not that high school and afterwards isn't, but w did you get involved in a, in a big campaign, a real campaign? I was volunteering on Senator Susan Collins' campaign in 2014, uh, and I later interned for her office uh, starting in 2019, and, and, and that lasted for two years. And what pushed you to, pr compelled you to go work for Senator Collins, who's a magnificent woman. But, uh, she is, and it's because she's such a magnificent woman and an inspirational figure in our politics today that drove me to want to intern in her office to learn more about public service, uh, its role in everybody's life, uh, and to help her represent the people of Maine in the United States Senate. Uh, and I gained a lot from that experience, and I have transferred uh, that experience in my role as a state legislator. Is one of the issues that you're most concerned with, is it energy? I served on the Energy Committee uh, during my first term. I think that um, 
energy costs are exorbitant, uh, and we need to do a lot to uh, make our energy sources more sustainable and more cost effective for people who are struggling, especially in Maine. We have a lot of seniors who are on fixed incomes, um, and these skyrocketing costs are, are really hurting them. What role do you think, if any, faith has played in your life? Because we hear so much about it now. Uh, where, do, where do you feel, where do you land on that? Well, my faith plays a part in every decision that I make. I turn on the news every morning, uh, sip a cup of coffee and eat breakfast. Uh, and the news sometimes gets you so down uh, with all the, the things happening in the world. And you have to have some element of faith that things will be all right in the end. Were, were you, when we grew up, uh, we were a Catholic family, not a, not a, a religious family that knelt down and prayed together every night, but we went to Mass on every Sunday and, and you know, went to Catholic school. Was that part of your environment also? Not the Catholic part of it, yeah. but the... I, I was baptized Catholic, but we attended a non, non-denominational service every Sunday. Um, and well, the nuns will pray for you, son. They'll, they'll give they you their will. blessing, yes. They will. <laughs> so you, non-denominational. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the hard questions now, is there anything that you feel right now? What do you feel most compelled to do other than, I assume, being a man of integrity and, and, and work for the people of Maine? But is there, is there a driving issue that, um, that motivates you to stay in this? Because it's gotten to be pretty rough and tumble. It has. Uh, actually, this morning I got a call from a constituent of mine whose son is in pretty rough shape, uh, and she didn't know who to call, so she called her state representative. And there's not much that I'm able to do for her, but I said I'd try my best to connect her to the people who could. So my constituents motivate me. Uh, there are people out there, just like my mom when she was raising me, single mothers, single fathers, who need help. Uh, and I think that. We live in a day and age where people's image of government is not a positive one. And I think that people in my profession, my colleagues, owe it to not only to ourselves, but to the people that we serve to give them an image of government that's accountable, that's transparent, that's effective, so that we can continue advocating for them. Tip O'Neill, as I'm sure you know, said all politics is local. We in my family say all politics is personal, and it sure does seem like Politics is personal for you. The right reasons at the right time to do to uh, do what politics is supposed to do: bring people together and make life better for every one of us. Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to ask you um, the official motto of the state of Maine. Is it Durego? Durego. And that means I lead. I lead. Well, I did a little bit of research, and I found out that literally. You do lead because Maine is the first state in the country that sees daylight. We are. <laughs> Look at that <laughs> smile. Uh, so let me ask you some not so serious questions now, if you. All right. All right. In one word, how would you describe Maine? For me, for lots of different reasons, it's home. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Teacher. What grade level? Any grade level. Elementary school, middle school, high school. I think I'd work well with any of them. What subject? History. One word to describe yourself. Optimistic. Hmm. Favorite TV show? The West Wing. Favorite music? Any music before the 50s, the 1850s. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be, for example? Uh, all kinds of classical music. Um, Beethoven, Bach. Okay. If you could have a superpower, what would it be? Invisibility. What's your favorite color? Red. And what's your birthday? I don't want to know the year. You don't have to tell me that. But just the date. May 18th. Oh, and that means you're a Taurus. Taurus. And do you put any stock in that? Not much. Well, you're down to earth, that's for darn sure, so that, that goes with it. It's entertaining. Um, 
what would you say is your theme song? That's Life by Frank Sinatra. When life pushes you down, you just get right back up again. Yes, it's not, and as my dad would say, it's not how often you get knocked down, it's how quickly you get back up. That's true. Thank you, Representative Carlo. Thank you. And thank you to our partners, the Starbucks New Yorkers Foundation. And remember, all politics is personal.